In 1862, Minnesota was a land being transformed by an influx of European immigrants. These immigrants were attracted to the open tracts of excellent farmland that Minnesota had to offer. As Minnesota's population dramatically increased, small settlement towns sprung up across the frontier with names like Sauk Rapids, New Ulm, and Mankato. With help from the newly built railroad, many of these towns established newspapers, usually tied to a specific political party. Mankato was no exception to this. The Mankato Record, published by John Wise, was a weekly newspaper with a Democratic bias. Its rival newspaper, the Mankato Independent, was published by Clinton B. Hensley. In an article written by Charles Lewis in 2011, he claims that despite publishing a newspaper with the name Independent, Hensley had been an ardent Republican. However, for others living in Minnesota, 1862 takes on a completely different meaning. For the Dakota tribes in Minnesota, 1862 was a year that erupted in war due to mistrust from many years of exploitation and marginalization. With the view that the natives should be westernized and adopt a true Christian religion, a series of land treaties beginning in 1830 led to even more strained relations between the Dakota and white settlers. These treaties guaranteed the Dakota annuity payments, food, and clothing. However, much of the payments went directly into the hands of the fur traders instead of the Dakota, and the food and clothing was delayed or never received. The clash between the two cultures came to a front on August 17, 1862, when a local trader refused to give the food rations in his warehouse to the Dakota, because he had not yet received payment from the government. When the trader, Andrew Murick, said, let them eat grass as an alternative to starvation, Chief Teowa Taduda, or Little Crow, apprehensively attacked and killed Murick the next day, sparking the Dakota conflict. Throughout the Dakota conflict, the United States military would employ firearms, cannons, and horses. However, Charles Lewis argues that the war waged by whites was also fought with ink and newsprint. Henry Sibley, Minnesota's first governor, had originally settled in Minnesota to prosper from the fur trade. However, with the decline of the fur trade, he turned his financial pursuits to land speculation and politics. Sibley and Alexander Ramsey both had ties to their prospective political party's newspapers and used its influence for political gain and as a source of advertisement for their newly acquired land. Sibley would later lead a regiment of soldiers against the Dakota in the battles at Birch Coulee and Wood Lake, the latter being the final battle of the Dakota conflict. Alexander Ramsey, Minnesota's second governor, also had financial ties to the railroad that was to run along the northern portion of the Minnesota River, formerly Dakota land. Although political opponents, Sibley and Ramsey both prospered from the Dakota land treaties, and Ramsey called for the complete removal or extermination of Dakota from Minnesota. After the attacks on the Lower Sioux Agency and Acton, Minnesota, Chief Little Crow, Chief Wabasha, and Chief Shakopee attacked the town of New Ulm, Minnesota on August 19th and again on August 23rd, 1862, forcing nearly 2,000 white settlers to seek refuge in nearby Mankato. According to the article written by Charles Lewis, it is clear that the Mankato editors harbored little genuine concern for the welfare of Indians. On August 30th, 1862, Wise wrote, The remedy for Indian-related issues would be to have Minnesota Indians totally exterminated or driven beyond our boundary. His rival, Clinton Hensley, agreed by writing that only bloody, relentless war until the last of the Sioux race is exterminated or driven beyond the borders of the states would satisfy the people. Although many of the editorials written by John Wise were racist, inaccurate, and he did not have a first-hand account of combat during the Dakota conflict, Wise did witness and report on the refugees from New Ulm flooding the streets of Mankato. On August 25th, Wise wrote, Soon a few horsemen arrived, then several teams, and next about 40 or 50 wounded, which constituted the advance of the large train. By six o'clock, the roads were completely jammed up with teams, cattle, and foot-sore soldiers who could barely drag their wearied bodies along. This thronged condition of the main thoroughfare continued all night and next morning until upwards of 3,000 persons had arrived. Every public and vacant building was crowded and overflowing, and Front Street was a mass of lively, excited people, horses, cattle, and wagons.
After the two attacks on New Ulm, the Dakota and Minnesota attacked Fort Ridgely twice, attacked Fort Abercrombie near present-day Fargo several times, and also attacked mail carriers, stage drivers, and military couriers trying to reach places like Pembina, St. Cloud, and Fort Snelling. On September 23rd, after their defeat at the Battle of Wood Lake, nearly 2,000 Dakotas surrendered and were moved to the Lower Sioux Agency. On November 7th, 1,700 of these prisoners began a six-day march to an internment camp located on Pike Island near Fort Snelling. 303 of the prisoners were sentenced to death by military commission and were moved to Camp Lincoln, just south of Mankato. Finally approving the execution of 39 of the 303 Dakota charged, President Abraham Lincoln set the execution date for December 19, 1862. However, the mass execution was postponed for a week because not enough rope of suitable size and quality could be procured in time. At 10 a.m. on December 26th, the day after Christmas and only two weeks after Lincoln's declaration of the emancipation of the slaves, the largest mass execution in United States history commenced with the killing of 38 Dakota soldiers. The town of Mankato, with a population of only 1,500 people, swelled, with 1,400 soldiers maintaining order under martial law and an estimated 4,000 white spectators who had flocked to the town. In April of 1863, Congress abolished the Pike Island Reservation and declared all previous land treaties with the Dakota to be null and void. One month later, the remaining Dakota at Pike Island were forced onto steamships and transported to the Crow Creek Reservation in South Dakota. After the removal, any person providing the scalp of a Dakota in Minnesota was given a reward of $25. Today, the Dakota tribes that once lived within the borders of Minnesota are scattered throughout the Midwest of the United States and Southern Canada. According to Charles Lewis' analysis, the writings of John Wise were a perfect example of the guard dog theory. The guard dog theory suggests that media usually do not serve entire communities but instead act as centuries for elements of the local power establishment. In other words, Wise was trying to promote a sense of calmness and stability during the Dakota conflict, while at the same time maintaining the overall power structure. Journalists in this mode of thinking tend to deliberately marginalize those outside the power hierarchies. This journalism certainly occurred in Mankato during 1862. Wise used propaganda, false claims, unreliable sources, and inaccuracies to promote his opinion of the Dakota. And therefore, Wise used media as a weapon against the Dakota. Obviously absent from his editorials were the opinions of whites like Henry Whipple, who called for leniency with the Dakota, and the Dakota themselves. Unfortunately, John Wise was successful as a guard dog in that his writing prose helped to garner support for the eventual removal of the Dakota from Minnesota. This guard dog theory is still utilized by media in our modern times and is just as detrimental now than it was during the Dakota conflict of 1862.